Hi, I'm Mark Cristiano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primer Vision Network. So today we have our frac spread count. We'll we'll go, we'll cover some high level stuff from the EIA show as well, just to kind of show where things sit. Because I know that I had some questions on Twitter, because unfortunately I was traveling throughout Canada. Um, which all the meetings were great. The actual travel itself was um, epically terrible. And, and I, I will joke about that when I go through some of this, but again, it's nice to be back. And then obviously next week we'll be, uh, we'll do our normal shows at the EIA and econ as well as frack spread. So with that being said, we want to look at what is the activity uh, coming in. And we had an increase of four. So we went from 284 to 288 spreads uh, that are active in the in the market. We had an increase of four in the Permian, which again, you know, getting back, you're starting to see a lot of that activity coming through. And then we had some smaller adjustments in some of the smaller uh, areas or smaller basins adding a, a spread, other ones seeing one spread fall off. But some of the big places that we continue to see and, and we think is gonna get a lot of uh, opportunity remains the Western Gulf, as well as obviously the Anadarko. The Western Gulf continues to see additions, which is something that is gonna continue, especially when you look at where is there available, available drilled but uncompleted wells or ducts, as we all like to call them. You know, where is that activity going to come from? And given you obviously have the juggernaut, which is the Permian, but then we're going to continue to see Texas be that show that strength, Louisiana, and, and also southern parts of Oklahoma. So when you but you know, one of the things that we keep talking about is that 290 number. So here we're, we're going to we're going to hit our that number that you know, about 290. We should see about another 10 come on or so as we go through really the, the into the end of June. But that 300 number is going to be difficult to really get through. And that's something where there's some smaller equipment, there's other equipment, depending on which basin gets activity. You know, we really have that peak at about 325, but it's not like you're going to hit that. So realistic, the realistic peak is about 315 or so, maybe something along those lines. So again, these are things that are going to come through and it's going to be difficult to get much past that in the near term. So now when we start looking at rigs and the rig activity that is that is uh, uh, happened, we had an increase of 14 rigs. Yay, 14 rigs. Uh, you know, I, I know more drilling is going to have uh, something fun for us this uh, this Friday before roll call. But when you look at oil, oil had an increase of 13, gas had an increase of one. Uh, and you, when you look at horizontal and directional, you can see horizontal had an increase of 13, directional an increase of one with a large part of this focused in Texas, not surprising given that's where we see a lot of the additional activity where we see uh, things really ramping up. And, and it's important to consider ramping up, but how? Because rigs are, are poking holes, frack spreads are actually bringing things to life. So we wanna look at where are we seeing these spreads and, and what is the spread between rigs and, uh, and, and uh, frack spreads. And here you can see it still remains fairly low. Obviously we had that huge run as is, especially when you look at the end of 2020, as you went, we went through all of 2021, or I should say most of 2021, when guys were, again, protecting the decline curve, trying to bring up production, working through a lot of those excess ducts that had been built up, but now you see that uh, rigs continue to run at a faster pace than spreads, which is something that we do see continuing through at least June, which is going to keep that spread a little bit lower. We do expect it to close the gap a little bit, you know, and, and get closer to what we've been saying about 0.4 which again, I think is a very stable when you look at historics to see not only some ducks coming, getting built, but also get uh, getting some completions uh, picking back up and puts that 12.2 million barrels a day uh, it, in completion coming through. I'm sorry, 12.2 uh, million barrels a day of production as we head into year end. Now, one of the things that we like to look at is what's happening ab abroad. And when you look at Singapore, you know, just looking at refined products, you can see that the middle distillate side continues to be the the problem area, and again, that's that's where diesels recognized in uh, in Singapore. You know, light distillate continues to fluctuate. You had a, a decent drop. That's something that will be rebuilt. Light distillate being the gasoline side, residual fuel had a, a sizable build. And again, that kept things fairly flat, but it's the middle distillate that is going to continue to be the underlying problem. And as it can, and we don't see it changing from these levels. And that's what we've been saying is 
diesel and, and distillate in general is going to continue to be in a very tight position. Now, when you shift over to uh, to Europe, you can see that gasoline had a big drop. And, and as we've said, you know, really the last couple of weeks on the EIA show, we expected to see this big shift in terms of exports coming from Europe into the U.S. markets because pad one or the East Coast is just is just a perfect spot for a lot of this to come in as gas oil had a small drop. But <clears throat> based on where imports are coming in, how how demand is doing in Europe, we expect uh, gas oil inventories to remain fairly flat. But fairly flat is still in a bullish position because it's at a such reduced number. So when you look globally speaking, there is a global diesel problem, not just a U.S. or other, which is something that we've really been highlighting and calling out on the EIA shows, which is why when you look at our views on how you know a lot of this inflation is in transitory, there's a lot of things built into that. So then when you look at pricing, uh, if you remember from last week, we thought that uh, diesel was going to hit $5.60. Um, we missed it. It was $5.57. You know, we thought we were going to get a little bit of a bump. You can see it flattened out a, a little bit, and, and we'll, we're going to talk a little bit about why as gasoline continue to have this very steady increase, which as these prices, especially on the gasoline side, continues to go up, that's going to attract a significant amount of international uh, flow especially when you look at where the disconnect is, because on the gasoline side, every area is fairly comfortable with, uh, I should say every area in the US, except the East Coast, which again, is going to attract more of that capacity. Now, when we look at distillate, we always want to talk about where the, 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 the deviations are, because when you look at the distillate number, so there was a small build of about 1.24 million but that's still 30 million below the five-year average. And when you look at pad one, pad one is 20.4 million below on that East Coast level, which again is, is where we're seeing that big disconnect because pad two, even pad three, again, all of them are, are fairly normal. There's not a huge deviation from, from what is normally happening this time of year because typically things slow down, you get a bit more of a build. But as we see exports coming down, which is what we've been talking about, because Europe was buying less from the US, more from the international markets, that slowed some of that down. Then we're going to see some of that pick back up. And uh, and again, pad one is going to uh, is going to just be in a sponge at this point. And just to put it into context on how low pad one is, Here's where we're sitting. So you can see that the trend is up. So typically at this point in time, we normally see an increase in uh, in builds, but we need the pace to pick back up. And the only way that can really happen is with a bigger increase in imports or just line two of the, of the colonial pipeline, just maxed out, pushing as much up there on the supply side. And then obviously on the demand side, watching demand fall, and we'll talk about demand in a minute. But again, you're seeing this. This is typically, this is why there's such a bullish backdrop because we are so low. Now there's there's things happening and we should be building at this point. So I, that's why we said we had a small build because we should be building. But what is the pace? The pace is what's going to matter from here on out. Not so much the build, but how big. And that, and this is why you're seeing that because we're, and this is going over the last 29 years, you get an idea of how low we are. But when you look at pad three versus how many, the 29 years, we're in a fairly comfortable spot, especially if you take out obviously the 2020 outlier, things are, are fairly normal. We're not in a place of panic. And when you look for 2022, this is the most distillate that has been in pad three for the whole year. So how do we get it to where it needs to be? And that's really going uh, on the colonial pipeline. They've already uh, frozen allocations and that's something that's gonna continue to, uh, to ramp up, at, but they will need allocations. We will see some imports and then how much of the Jones Act vessels will be sold out. And then how do we try to close this gap to get product that's in pad three or the, or the Gulf of Mexico and get it into uh, the East Coast? Now, when we start looking at gasoline, I think it's important to look and talk about, you know, demand. So when you look at demand, we typically get a, a, a steady increase ahead of Memorial Day, which is not this coming Monday, but the following Monday. That is where you normally see this, this final push. And, and it normally happens, you know, here it either happens next week or the week before, but you can see this is normally when we get this spike. 
So when you're talking about demand, it's important to look at, well, where are we in the cycle and when should demand start to come back? So as we've been saying, we just expect to stay kind of fair in a fairly tight range due to pricing. And as we've been saying for months and months, the U.S. doesn't have demand destruction in the way where like there's a big collapse. It's just that we don't get a seasonal bump. You know, instead of getting the seasonal bump, you just kind of, you know, suck within this tight range or stuck within this tight range. And that is where we continue to see. But distillate now has come down. We think it, it holds this point at this level. And then as whenever China starts to reopen and we get a new influx of capacity or I should say new influx of, uh, of goods, that's when we'll start to see this come back up. But obviously, uh, when you look at demand, demand is going to remain a bit on the low side, just given where we are on the uh, supply chain logistics side. Now, Google mobility data here, you can see that things have uh, continued to recover along those seasonal lines. You know, there's been some flatlining. Europe had a, had a, a nice spike. So the question is going to be what happens as we go forward? Is, are we going to come back to the uh, to that level? You can see North America flatlining a bit. Uh, again, we've been saying about 92 to 93 percent against normal. And then Asia Pacific is on the TomTom -tom side. You can see the congestion still a little bit below normal. Google Mobility, it's just a different way of looking at it. But you can see there's still there's still progress being made. There's still some of these uh, movements. But in Asia Pacific uh, specifically, there are subsidies, and the question is always going to be when do those go away? And that's going to be, I think, the bigger pivot in terms of where things are. Now we look at TSA passengers. My running joke is uh, based on what it was. You could have counted me twice because it took so long to travel. I could have been counted on Sunday and Monday because I was still in transit. I was still going through everything. It was literally, it was one of the worst uh, five flights I've had in a very long time. But you can see that we're just, as we've been saying, just sitting just beneath. We had a nice little bump, but against seasonal norms, we should be getting that increase. So again, it's what is the rate of change above what is normal? And right now, we're just not getting that. Now, when you start looking at China and things flowing, you're starting to see a little bit of that congestion ease, but it's creating congestion in other port operations now because it's just everything was so backed up. Everything started going in other areas. Now, as things start to open back up, there's going to be this flood coming down. And we're going to continue to see just the number of uh, of, of ships, the, the, the underlying congestion is going to remain in a, a huge problem. And then, and that's when you start looking at the inflation side, because you have the logistics, the supply side still being a problem. You have inflation. But when you start looking at the backdrop, you can see that retail sales inflation adjusted continues to weaken while retail sales running prices went up. But so people are paying more, but spending less. So you're paying up, but you're not spending the same amount because you're, you're essentially buying less stuff. If you were buying the same amount of stuff, these would be moving in the same direction, but you're starting to see that deviation. And when you look at what a re, uh, a inflation adjusted retail sales were, it was negative. So again, you're continuing to see some of these pressure point. And the reason why is when you look at food and service sales, you can see that that has gone up on it on, but then on the nominal do dollar side, disposable income. So, so disposable income in nominal dollars is up 5%. But when you look at adjusted retail and food service sales, it's up 12.4%. So from pre-pandemic level, US retail sales through April are up at 12.4% annualized rate. Meanwhile, disposable income is up at 5% annualized rate. So when you look at inflation, this is where you're getting that disposable income negative, and that's when you're starting to see this bigger slowdown. Now, when you look at retail sales as an as a whole, retail sales were up 0.9%, but adjusted for inflation was down 0.5%. And you can see people are, are, are front loading where things are being spent. So obviously, gasoline stations is going to be lumpy back and forth, but we do expect to see some of those shifts with food service and obviously becoming a bigger part. Miscellaneous retail, uh, retailers, again, some of these fluctuations will be there, but again, that, that's going to be something to watch going forward. Now, when you look at China and what they're trying to do, $5.3 trillion boost is what has been talked about, but it's important to see where is it coming from? Because where is this money being generated from? You can see, obviously, 2020 was a banner year. 
for everybody, not just China. But when you start looking at where is the money coming from, you know, we still have general budget spend that still remains the big piece. SPB or local special purpose bonds, those remain actually flat from 2021, but you're getting tax and fee cuts. So they're breaking it out because tax and fee cuts are general budget spending. And, and the reason why I say that is because you're you're going to have less revenue going into the spend. So that's gone up. And, and that's something that they've been doing. You look at 2020, then you look at 2021, then you look at 2022. Taxes and fees are just getting added. They haven't increased any of them. They've only been cutting them. And that be, is, again, some of the underlying problems as well. And then liquidity via triple R and, and uh, triple R being the cut in the rate, which is something that we had expected. So now when we look at just the aggregate in general, money supply starting to go up a bit. But when you look at the M1 and the M2, which is a bit more of a leading indicator, it's it's gone up, but not a huge amount. And again, everyone keeps talking about a huge surge. We're just not getting this big increase. And, and so when you start looking at the underlying data sets here, you can see that term le uh, lending was, was flat. Industrial production, steeply negative at negative 2.9. Retail sales, huge miss, miss coming in at negative 11.1. And all of this is well below uh, uh, estimates. This is well below, again, showing this pressure. We'll talk more about this in the econ show, but we just wanted to kind of tee up where things are while new home prices fell again. And, and now when you look at prime rates, one-year prime rate up, uh, uh, you know, it didn't go to where estimates were, but the five-year was the one that, over, that went further to the downside. And that's a bit more of a bullish side uh, for, for what they're trying to do for support. But we want to tease that out because they're doing some stuff, but not a lot. And, and again, this is what we've been saying is that they're going to do things. They're, they're going to try to take action, but they're really going to be hamstrung into how much which when you think about China and the largest, uh, second largest economy, one, the largest growth section for oil and products, this is going to be some of those overhang. So that's what we have for you today. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, please again, find me on Twitter, find me on email or in the comments section, please like, share, subscribe, and we hope you have a great weekend. Thanks again for watching. I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings coming to you from Primary Vision Network.